let me welcome on behalf of the WWEA, uh, all of those who are participating in this webinar, an important webinar. Uh, it's uh, important to the Ren Alliance uh, that the WWEA can contribute its part to what we're all seeking, which is to achieve a world free of uh, the problems of climate change and a world which uh, can join together in taking the necessary measures. And WWEA has been an important part of that, formed in 2001 with uh, something over 600 members now from 100 countries. It uh, plays a pivotal role in what is one of the very important aspects of the measures being taken to uh, prevent climate change and to uh, save uh, the world, the 8 billion people of the world uh, from the adverse impact uh, already being experienced of, uh, of climate change. I think it's important that uh, we remember that uh, we have a role to play of joining together, of assisting each other in the fight against climate change. And so it becomes very important that webinars such as this are held and that we all participate in exchanging information about how rapid is the development which is taking place. Rapid development is an important part of trying to achieve the changes that are necessary. And so a webinar from uh, people around the world today is an important part of the fight against climate change. I think it's a matter of importance uh, to not only the members of the WWEA, but of uh, the members of all of the associations which form the Ren Alliance, that we can together take measures and keep each other informed as to the rate of change. So I thank uh, each uh, Stefan who will be the first uh, speaker and then the other speakers who will follow. Uh, throughout the day, some 10 or more, uh, who will be giving what is happening in their area so that we can draw it together and find out what is the rate of change that's taking place, what is the rate of development. And I welcome you all and those who are going to join uh, later, welcome to this WWEA webinar. And I hand back to Stefan to uh, organize uh, the uh, remainder of the webinar. Thank you very much for the opportunity to welcome you all and I look forward to what you've got to say and what others may wish to talk about at some later stage as they review what is produced during this webinar. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much Peter for uh, the, the welcome. Uh, before we now start with the presentations, I would uh, just also uh, like to make some formal announcements. So this webinar is a public event, so it uh, will be broadcasted on our YouTube channel. Um, so whatever you say, whenever you speak, please be aware that it is in principle accessible by everyone. So I would like everyone to be aware of this, of course. Um, I would like also everybody to stay muted until you are requested to speak. Um, so, of course, the speakers then uh, will unmute themselves. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, then you are invited, of course, to write in the chat. Uh, but we also may have some time for questions, and then we will ask the person to speak um, and ask the questions verbally. Yeah. Um, Thank you from my side already now to all our speakers. We have uh, this morning from the European perspective, so the first part of the session uh, about the kind of Eastern Hemisphere, and we will then have a one and a half hour break and then start with uh, some presentations from the Western Hemisphere. Um, I would also like to say, uh, give a special thank you to our partner, um, Profec Ventus, which is one of our members and which has been the, the supporter of this webinar and which allows us to offer this information for free. Yeah, we're very pleased to have people from around the world as our speakers sharing firsthand information. 
And I would, before uh, we start with that, like to give you um, just brief slides and overview of where we stand globally. Uh, we uh, published very recently our annual report, and uh, this is uh, what has come out. So this is a development which I think is still very impressive. You look at it um, when we when we see kind of the uh, the roots of today's modern wind power utilization. We don't go back to 100 years, 140 years ago when actually the first windmills were used for electricity generation, and then there were some activities in the 1920s, 30s, and even in the 50s. But today, wind power uh, is close to 1 million megawatt installed capacity starting that was in the US in 1980 with Carter administration. At that time, we recorded 8 megawatts. So that is factor 100,000. Today, producing around 1,800 terawatt hours, uh, which is a, a global share of around 8%. Um, so these are the developments of, of the last couple of years. And you see here that in uh, 10 years, there's a, a kind of uh, triplification, I hope I used the right word here, Tr three times as much installed capacity as uh, we used to have in the year 2013. Um, when you look at the new installed wind capacity, you see some up and down during that period. Um, actually, the year 2021 with around 100,000 uh, megawatt of new installed capacity came for us as a positive surprise because during the COVID period, we expected there would be some slowdown. But obviously, that slowdown happened in the past year when, and we, we made a survey amongst our members, the expectations and predictions even during the year 2022 indicated that there would be uh, more new installations. But we came out with 88 gigawatt of new installed capacity, which is substantially less. So obviously, um, there are still projects which couldn't be completed, and they will uh, probably be the de de um, They've just been delayed and will be completed in this year, 2023. You also see from the development of the, the annual wind power growth rates that there is that up and down, and we are at the moment at around 10, 11% of annual growth. Of course, it's normal that when a uh, technology is new on the market, that you have new um, development, you have at the beginning higher growth rates, but of course, what we saw in the last year, that's not enough when we see the new ambitions from governments, also in the light of the global energy crisis. That must change, and we hope that we see bigger growth rates in the next, in this year and in the next years to come. Um, I'm not going now into detail about the leading markets, the countries, because we will hear from most of them today during the webinar. But uh, just to give you an idea where we are, of course, China is by far the leader, and this is uh, kind of uh, visually presented here, the shares of the leading countries in the global overall uh, wind power capacity. You can very well see that China and the United States together, they really stand for lion's share, and yet there are some other countries which are still visible. When we look at the uh, development of um, new added capacity, then it's very clear or even clearer that the leading markets have a very big share. Although what we still see at the same time that there's been a diversification, we have now far more than 100 countries on uh, in our statistics which are um, using wind power and where we can gather statistics from. So that is just before we start with the country focus um, to have the overall picture. Thank you very much uh, for listening to that. And uh, unless we have any direct questions to that, uh, which I don't see at this point of time, um, I would then like to go to our first country presentation. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Andrew Bray here from the Renewable Energy Alliance from Australia. Um, and we start with Australia because you are, we're grateful you're still available for us. For, us, uh, for you, it is already evening. So a very good evening too. I understand you're close to Canberra and you will now share with us where Australia stands. Let me, before now we start, also uh, mention that uh, we have requested everyone every speaker to keep 15 minutes. And in order to support you with that, I know you're always focusing, of course, in your presentation. Uh, my colleague Martina will indicate when 10 minutes are over and then when 13 minutes are over so that you can 
uh, better manage your time and focus mainly on what you want to say. So with this, Andrew, again, welcome, and I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, you can see my screen okay there? Yes, looks good. Right, thank you. Um, and yes, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for, um, for tuning in. And, and again, to Peter and Stefan and the World Wind Energy Association for having us along to this um, this important event that happens each year. Um, we were going to have you um, host you here for the the World Wind Energy Conference, but um, alas, that's that's not no longer happening. So we'll have to make do with this. <clears throat> uh, so uh, just quickly um, to talk a little bit about who we are. Um, Stefan was reminding me before the, the call started that. Actually, a lot of the member organisations of the World Wind Energy Association are um, sort of groupings of small wind developers or small wind projects in, in your own country. Um, <clears throat> we're a bit different in that regard in that we are a, a not-for-profit uh, advocacy group uh, in Australia. Um, there really isn't a very large small wind sector here, so that's... Um, uh, you know, we, we're certainly in touch with those those small companies that are there, but but essentially our role is to bring regional communities into um, uh, into the energy transition. So so we advocate for a just energy transformation that that safeguards the social, environmental, climactic, and the economic future of uh, Australian families and communities. And in Australia, it's quite notable that the large scale wind and solar farms are um uh in in the country so you have the cities there's not very much large scale um there but but once you move out beyond the city bounds that's where you're finding the uh finding the renewable energy uh so the sort of work we do we work with communities um advocate to industry and government um, and also work within the climate movement uh so this it's quite a bit bit of work to be done there to again bring all those different community voices into the discussion and that's the kind of work that we we like to do um and i should just clarify too that um re alliance it's a little bit close to ren alliance and um and you know i apologize for that <laughs> that slight overlap there but um but essentially uh we were the australian wind alliance for the first seven years of our life but for the last three years we've been renewable energy alliance and uh, a lot of our work happens in renewable energy zones, which are new clusters, if you like, of wind, solar and um, and transmission that we're building in Australia. Uh, so in terms of the uh, where we're at in Australia, uh, last year was was quite a dramatic change uh, in the political landscape in that after nine years of a, a coalition government um, uh, the the Labor Party was was elected to government uh, federally, uh, and and actually they they're also in power in most of the states now. Um, so that's that's signalled quite a dramatic change at a federal level, um, where clean energy and climate commitments are now are now part of the discussion. Uh, and since the government came in, uh, they've legislated a forty three percent reduction in emissions by twenty thirty. Uh, that's not terribly ambitious and it's certainly not part of a 1.5 degree um, emission reduction scenario. Um, however, it is better than what the previous government had um, and, and, and it's legislated now in a way that it wasn't before. So, so that is a step forward. Um, and, and what we're seeing um, and it, it, at the state level is that there are policies supportive of clean energy in all of the states. And it hasn't mattered if they were uh, Labor or Liberal governments. At the state level, we had quite a sensible and progressive um, approach to renewable energy. And uh, we now have that at the federal level as well. Uh, so in terms of uh, where we got to last year, um, it was interesting to see your slides at the beginning there uh, about the national uh sorry international uh context for renewables growth we've sort of had a similar a similar um similar picture here 
So last year we had 35.9% um, of our uh, energy in Australia comes from renewables, and that was up from 32.5% uh, last year. Um, and that's so that's grown quite dramatically. And um, I think it was only five years ago, it was only half as much. So in the last the last five years, we've doubled the proportion of renewables uh, in <clears throat> in the uh, in the energy system, and reduced our coal and gas quite significantly in that time. Uh, last year, there was 2.4 gigawatts of solar capacity added. Uh, again, a little bit down on what it was in previous years, but nevertheless, that's still quite a good growth rate. Rooftop solar is a really big part of our energy system here in Australia. Um, in a way that I'm, I'm not sure it is in many other countries. Um, wind capacity, there was 1.4 gigawatts added of uh, new wind capacity last year, 1,400 megawatts. Um, and again, a little bit down from what where we were in 2021, where we had 1,700 megawatts. Uh, uh, so a bit of a slowdown there. Uh, however, uh, one one sort of good thing we can say is that there are five gigawatts or five thousand megawatts of wind and solar that um, that are under construction um, at the end of 2022. So that's that's quite a bit, and certainly signals that we'll add quite a lot more this year than we did the previous year. Uh, in terms of winds. Uh, share of that renewable energy uh, quota. Um, <clears throat> uh, what we see is that wind uh, provides about 35% of Australia's uh, renewables. That is, um, uh, it's it's the highest, you know, it's, it's the highest um, contributor of renewables um, generation uh, that we have, followed by rooftop solar, large scale solar, and then hydro. Um, as you can see, that's dropped a little bit this year only because there was a lot more solar um, uh, came on board last year than wind. Uh, and so in terms of Australia's total electricity, it's about 12.8% uh, comes from wind power. Uh, the new capacity, um, wind energy contributed the highest amount of new large scale capacity last year, as I mentioned, with 1400 megawatts. Um, <clears throat> and there are 21 new wind projects uh, in construction in different parts of the country at the moment, uh, totaling four and a half thousand megawatts. So that's quite big. Uh, and it, it's worth noting too that Australia will build is currently building its um, largest wind farm <clears throat> that we've seen here, which will be uh, once it's completed over a thousand megawatts <coughs> of wind power in in Queensland. Uh, that's called the McIntyre Wind Farm. It's being built by um, Achiona, the Spanish, um, and excuse my pronunciation, my poor pronunciation, but um, the Spanish wind company, Achiona, who, who have um, quite a large presence here in Australia. Uh, and so that's, it's notable in that our currently high, the largest wind farm we currently have is five, 130 megawatts. So this will be double that size. So you can see that the size of um, wind projects in Australia is, is only growing as we go forward and as um, wind turbine uh, sizes increase. Offshore wind is now um, coming a bit more into prominence. Uh, we don't have any offshore wind farms in Australia yet, uh, but but all of the enabling mechanisms that we need to, to see them built are now starting to come on. So there's a licensing regime to regulate the offshore wind industry um, was only introduced last year in the middle of um, in the middle of June, again after that after the federal election. So we've we've sort of had the offshore wind discussion going in Australia for some time, but it really took the change of government to, to get that moving. Um, so we look, we have 50 gigawatts worth of announced <clears throat> offshore wind projects around the country. Um, that that's a bit of an ambit claim, to be honest. The, the 50 gigawatts, um, we certainly won't be seeing 50 gigawatts built anytime soon. Um, but there are a handful of uh, reasonably advanced projects. The main one being um, Star of the South, uh, which is a 
uh, I think 2.2 gigawatt uh, project, uh, which is, um, yeah, which has been developed in Bass Strait, uh, sort of just below the mainland of Australia. Um, so we certainly have very strong um, offshore wind resources. Uh, until now, because we've had such strong onshore wind resources, we haven't had to really move towards offshore. We've got quite a lot of land and we've got good wind onshore. Um, but now I think we're starting, now that we're looking at a, what a decarbonised grid in Australia will look like, offshore wind uh, has quite a complementary generation profile from onshore so that it uh, it generates uh, in a different sort of at different times from the onshore um, uh, fleet, and therefore it, it be, it's starting to become of more interest to investors. First ten minutes are over. Thanks, Martina. Um, so this is actually my last slide, so there should be time for questions. I hope I might just mention a couple of other things as we kind of look ahead um, in terms of transmission. Uh, the, the Australian energy market operator has estimated that 10,000 kilometres of new transmission lines will be required by 2050. So that's a huge, huge uh, build out of transmission that we're going to need uh, as we go forward. And that's quite a lot of quite a lot of projects. Um, uh, many of, the, of which are quite advanced. Uh, but the only one that's actually being built at the, at the moment is one called Project Energy Connect which is connecting South Australia uh, to, the, to the state of New South Wales. And, um, and that one is, they're actually putting up pylons now, which is the first uh, major transmission line built in Australia, well, for decades, actually. We just haven't been doing it for a while, so we're now starting to ramp up there. But it's worth noting that the public acceptance of new transmission projects is still quite challenging. So you're finding a lot of um, a lot of community resistance to to uh, projects. Transmission companies are still getting the hang of what good solid community engagement looks like and how to do it effectively. Uh, so that's we've still got a bit of work to do in that regard. Uh, energy storage. It's worth mentioning that um, we had thirteen hundred and eighty megawatts uh, and nearly two thousand megawatt hours of large scale batteries under construction, which is up a little bit from the previous year. Um, and we have some quite quite big batteries uh, lined up to be built within the next three years. So quite a lot of battery storage coming in. Um, uh, there's a number of pumped hydro projects, but they're proving much harder to get up here. So batteries seem to be stepping into that space, um, which is lucky because coal closures are now starting to accelerate in Australia. Um, <clears throat> now that we have the climate targets and renewable energy targets in place, um, we're starting to see the coal plants bringing forward their, their closure. And some of them are very old. They should have really closed, you know, years ago. So uh, Liddell is uh, 51 years old and it's actually closing this week. So um, so that's a, a bit of a... Uh, a bit of a milestone, really, in our energy transition. And that's 13 minutes, isn't it, Martina? Uh, Large-scale investment is currently coming online more slowly than is required. So the government has forecast that we'll, uh, they want to get to 82% renewables in the energy sector, electricity sector by 2030. Um, so we're building quite a lot, but we're probably not building it quick enough. And we're certainly not building the transmission quick enough to connect it. Uh, for us to get to 82%. So while things are moving, they really do start need to start, they need to start moving a lot quicker. Uh, so that's that's all from me, but uh, happy to take any questions that uh, people might have if there's time. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think that was a very good overview of a country which has developed a quite amazing uh, momentum in renewable energy in, in wind power, but in particular then also in uh, solar power and based, of course, in some parts of, of the country with a strong hydro backup. Um, let me just uh, add to what you said that our World Wind Energy Conference, we've had to postpone that and we are uh, hopeful that we can soon announce the, the new date. So there's been some conflict with political meetings out, out of our control, but uh, please uh, 
stay. Um, we will certainly inform you about uh, the the new developments here. Um, do we have any questions to our speaker? That seems not the case. So again, thank you so much. And maybe you've noticed that we've started in the meantime, the Facebook live stream, which uh, uh, took a little bit longer than expected. So we are now also live. And uh, again, as I said, uh, YouTube will also be available. So thank you. Then we would uh, move to our next speaker. And uh, this is uh, Mr. Fan Guo from the Chinese Wind Energy Association. I assume you are based, you're talking to us uh, from Beijing. So A, let me have a look at the time. I think a very good afternoon to Beijing. And uh, the floor is yours. That's funny. So I have made you co-host, so it should be possible that you can share your screen with us. Um, of course, I think that it's not too much uh, to say, if I say in the meantime, China has, of course, the attention of the world uh, wind community. We've had our World Wind Energy Conference 2004 when the Chinese market was at uh, around five, six total installed capacity. And now you will hear uh, it's almost a factor of a thousand in those 20 years that have passed since that time. Now, please, uh, Mr. Fan Guo. I don't know whether you are speaking, but at least I cannot understand you well. Before, I heard you well, but at the moment, your voice, if there is, it is your voice, it's very weak. Speak loudly. <laughs> now it come, you come back, yes. Okay, can you hear me? Uh... Yes, now it's getting better. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will start my presentation, the update uh, status of wind power in China. So uh, there will be three main parts, the status quo, the potential and the prospect, and the challenges we're facing. Uh, so I will try my best to respect the limitation, the time uh, limit, uh, because there's uh, many information. So uh, I start from the status quo. Uh, as we know, China uh, for around 40 years is the biggest market in the world for the wind power. And the new installed capacity in 2022 is uh, around 50 gigawatt, including uh, around 43 gigawatt for onshore and uh, uh, five gigawatt for for, for offshore. In by the end of 2022, the cumulative capacity has reached uh, around 400 gigawatt, so representing most uh, one half of the global capacity. And uh, we know the proportion of the power uh, of the um, power generation is uh, very important in this. And uh, as we see by the end of 2022, the power, uh, the proportion of the wind generation has raised, uh, as we see from very low to 8.8%. Uh, and so, and now uh, wind power is surpassing nuclear power as the third, uh, third largest power source in China. And we focus on the, the offshore wind. And in 2022, the new capacity uh, in China is around five, uh, five gigawatt and bring the total capacity of offshore to around 30 gigawatt. Uh, as we see uh, in, 20, uh, uh, in 2022, there's a 
significant decrease in offshore capacity of offshore wind just because uh, the cancellation of the national subsidy in 2022. So uh, that means there were a booming increase in uh, 2021 uh, just to seize the last chance to benefit the national uh, subsidies for the offshore wind. And globally, uh, uh, China uh, is uh, still the most uh, powerful engine for the global offshore wind development. So uh, in 2022, the new uh, capacity uh, uh, in the world is about 10 gigawatt and uh, about one half is uh, uh, is is in China. Even we say uh, there's a deceleration in China uh, in 2022 because of the cancellation of the national subsidies. And regarding the uh, innovation of wind power, the emerging uh, floating offshore wind is also uh, Developing, so we see uh, three uh, type co uh, project. It's uh, Fuyao, uh, developed by China Shipbuilding, uh, uh, China State Shipbuilding Corporation, and the leading project uh, developed by Three uh, George uh, Corporation, and the Guanlan, uh, the third uh, type co pilot project developed by China National. Uh, uh, offshore oil cooperation. And uh, for the technology progress, as we know, uh, the uh, single power of the wind turbines uh, become larger and larger. And from the data we collect in 2022, uh, the power of the onshore uh, wind uh, turbine is around six to seven megawatt, and the new uh, issued uh, wind power has um, the, the the single power is around uh, eight megawatt, and the 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 new one from Envision Corporation uh, is ten is ten megawatt. And for the offshore wind, uh, the largest one is uh, the largest one is uh, eighteen megawatt uh, in two thousand twenty-three. I just issued uh, this year by CSSC, and we know uh, in line with the increase of wind turbine power. The blade as well as the rotor uh, diameter has also been continuously increased in recent years, and we see uh, from the data. And uh, so the record for the rotor diameter of the onshore is uh, exceed two uh, two hundred sixteen meter, and uh, for offshore it's uh, more than two hundred sixteen. Measures, and so there's some pictures from uh, from the factory for the new issued uh, rotor uh, the the blade, and in line with the uh, progress of the blade and the wind turbine, the hub, uh, we uh, the hub the height uh, the height of the hub is getting uh, higher and higher. So we see uh, uh, the, the, the maximum height, uh, height is about uh, 117 meters in, in the last year in the, in the market. And along with uh, technological progress in China, uh, we saw that uh, the, the Wind turbine made in China has began to uh, 
replicated in the in the worldwide. And in just in last year, there's uh, there were more than uh, four thousand wind turbine uh, exported from China to the worldwide. And the cumulated capacity of the exportation of wind turbine in China is about uh, twelve gigawatts for now. In this part, I will give some um, uh, forecast from our side for the wind turbine, uh, for the wind power development in China. Uh, as we know, uh, China has just issued a very ambitious uh, carbon neutral goals. Uh, Within 2013 and 2016. So, uh, for achieving uh, those goals, um, the development of the renewable energy uh, will play a key role. And in the newly issued five years plan uh, in last year, so the landscape of the Renewable energy development is uh, defined as uh, generally uh, 14 uh, clean energy, uh, a great clean energy base, including, as we see, uh, nine energy based uh, onshore, including not only wind power, but also solar power and uh, hydropower and five uh, clean energy base for offshore wind across uh, around all the coast regions in China. The first 10 minutes are over. Uh, and we, we hope also uh, the wind energy uh, developed in the rural area, uh, but for for the economy development, uh, because not only the power plant but also the industrial value chain and and the job is is provided. And for the forecast uh, to be short, we expect uh, for twenty uh, for two thousand twenty five um, more than uh, ninety. Uh, wind power will be uh, newly installed, uh, including uh, 70 gigawatt for onshore and 20 gigawatt for offshore. And for the SOE, uh, there is a, a significant decrease uh, during the last decade. And for the prediction, we uh, uh we expecting uh there one yuan uh, per kilowatt hour there are two yuan per kilowatt hour and there are three yuan per kilowatt hour for the three typical uh developing areas in china for the wind power and we expecting also the integration and innovation for uh of the wind power for example with the hydrogen power and to 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 solve the the issues of the integration and the challenges. Uh, to be short, as we know, the three north area is a, a traditional uh, developing area for the wind power because of the good resources. But we are uh, but because the is far from the low center, so the China has develop uh, progressively the wind power uh, in the south and mid east areas and uh, for the offshore wind uh, of course the co the cost reduction and the deep water policies is uh, quite important and for overall uh, we 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 are continually working to uh, increase the uh, power system flexibility uh, because there's a, there will be a long-term 
issues uh, due to the high benefit of the renewable but intermittent resources. So uh, that's all for my presentation. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Van Gogh, for presenting the impressive uh, success story of wind power in China, which is indeed important for the world. Um, not only because China is, of course, and, and now the a, a very large economy is, is about to be the largest economy. And so for the climate, that's important, but also the technical leadership that China has taken um, over in the industry that you reflected to the development is, of course, very, very important for all of us. Now, let me have a look whether we have any questions for you. Um, I don't see questions at the moment. So uh, again, thank you so much. And then uh, I would like to welcome our next speaker. And we're kind of staying in the region. It's my great pleasure to welcome now Professor Chuichi Arakawa from the Japan Wind Energy Association and also a vice president of our association, World Wind Energy Association, active or originally as a professor uh, for many uh, decades now uh, in research, but also promotion of wind power. And now, Chuichi, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, you to um, that we can hear about the latest developments in Japan. Uh... Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, it's my uh, big pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, Japanese status of wind power in Japan using the slide. Okay, now I'd like to move to the slide. It's a big problem for me. Wait a minute, please. Maybe in the meantime, I can just mention that there was a remarkable meeting recently in Japan with the G7 leaders, uh, and they uh, agreed that together the G7 countries would focus on offshore wind, and uh, they agreed on substantial targets for that. But I see that your presentation is now um, um, online, and uh -huh. hand over back to you. Can you see yes. my presentation now? Yes. Presentation slide? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I, it's very difficult for me to explain Japanese status uh, just after uh, China. And uh, in China, they have the total accumulations of 400 uh, gigawatt in one country. <laughs> but in Japan, uh, we have just four gigawatt in Japan, not 40. Uh, not 40, not 400. But anyway, we are very ambitious for introducing uh, wind energy focusing on offshore wind in Japan. Now you can see uh, our history of installed capacity of wind power generation. Uh, now uh, this is the last, uh, the new installed capacity last year just 200 megawatt, not gigawatt. It's a big problem. 5% uh, uh, growth uh, to the total accumulation in Japan. The detail is here, uh, cumulative, uh, the cumulative, cumulative installed capacity uh, is uh, 4,800 uh, 4, um, megawatt, something like that. Any its size is very small comparing with uh, China. And now we have the position here uh, in the uh, table of world uh, total accumulation. Our position is just uh, is only 22, uh, 20 second, 20 second position ranking in the world. Yes. Uh, when I started my research 20 years ago, Japan was located around here, top 10 countries, but now under 20 countries. But uh, as I ha we have already told you, we are very eager to develop offshore wind. Uh, but of course, in Japan, uh, we are very eager to introduce uh, solar 
uh, PV, something like that. You can see only yellow graphs, which shows uh, solar PV in Japan. Uh, in other countries, China, US, Germany, India, it's uh, now uh, around the similar uh, accumulations, a similar uh, part, similar uh, numbers, but in Japan, uh, most of renewable energy is solar. Uh, for example, uh, wind power is just 4.6 gigawatt, but PV 84 gigawatt just 5% to photovoltaic. It's a big problem. Uh, wait, uh, oh. Yes, of course, uh, this is uh, one symbol of technology in the wind power, wind energy. Uh, this is a floating offshore wind, Japanese uh, wind uh, turbines, two megawatt uh, downwind turbines, uh, but uh, furthermore, this is a flow, uh, spa type of floating wind, uh, floating offshore wind. Uh, we have already completed this technology around 10 years ago, but anyway, uh, this is the first uh, big technology of wind power in Japan for offshore wind. And uh, in the former time, our government uh, had a very conservative uh, vision of renewable energy, especially for wind power. Uh, five years ago, uh, they decided just 1.7% of wind to total power generation ratio in as a target of 2030. But now, of course, the government has decided to extend uh, the power uh, part of renewable energy, especially wind power, uh, from 1.7% to 5% in 2030. Totally uh, 36 or 38% from renewable energy. It's a very good improvement. It's okay. But even in this case, they keep uh, the new, uh, for, uh, they keep the, some uh, conservative target to 2050, 2050, such as 30 to 40% from nuclear or some or something, uh, uh, not pure renewable energy. Renewable energy is just 50, 60%. Now, I, we push the government again to increase uh, renew pure renewables to uh, 80% from 50 to 60. To, uh, so uh, our 80% will be the new target in our private discussion among the renewable energy group. Anyway, the government uh, is changing their style into uh, account, uh, taking into account, uh, uh, taking account into uh, the renewable energy. Yes, uh, three years ago, I have proposed uh, uh, offshore wind in the TV, uh, NHK, Japanese broadcasting key stations. Uh, so uh, this is a time when we start uh, the offshore wind using the huge uh, potential of uh, offshore wind. Yes, uh, you can see uh, this figures. Now these figures after now are borrowed, uh, are used from uh, Mr. Weda. Uh, he's a secretary general of Japan Wind Power Association, is an industry group in Japan. Now electricity generation is uh, here, peak, uh, fifth position in Japan is uh, so big number for electric generations. The carbon dioxide em emissions is also the same level in the world. But uh, EEZ, our uh, economic exclusive zone in ocean, has a similar scale, uh, sixth position in the world. 
Uh, for example, uh, European countries uh, doesn't appear this figure, but Japan appears uh, in, in the position of the exclusive economic zone in the ocean. It means we have so many potentials of the offshore wind. So this is a time to push uh, government to accept offshore wind. Uh, this is a, a kind of agreement with industry group and uh, our government. Uh, finally, this is a kind of uh, uh, milestones of the government, of course. Now, by 2030, we will extend uh, offshore wind to 10 gigawatt, 10 gigawatt. Furthermore, by 2040, 30 gigawatt to 45, something like that. And furthermore, uh, by 2040, it's better to uh, take that a kind of local content, 60%, something like that. Uh, now, you may know that uh, we don't have any big manufacturers of wind turbines. Uh, big three companies for manufacture of wind turbine stopped their production around three or four years ago. Anyway, uh, local content and the cost reduction. Of course, now we have already started uh, port area, port area, uh, because it's a free from the uh, strong relationship of the uh, fishermen's union, something like that. So it's very easy to introduce offshore wind in the port area. Now we have just already started. And the main topic uh, nowadays in Japan is a general sea area where we need a good communication each other with the fishermen and industry, of course, the government and local government. It's very uh, sensitive area. Future, in future, We'd like to go to so-called EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone, which has a huge area, as I have already explained. The three uh, steps in Japan. Yes, th this is a very detailed uh, number of offshore wind. We are now around here. Uh, we are very, uh, man we managed, we are managing the, offshore wind in uh, port sea area. Furthermore, now uh, even under development, but uh, the government has already moved to the tenders of the general sea area, round one, round two, and furthermore, big size of the sea area. 12 Just, minutes are over. Oh, okay, thank you. This is a, a Japanese map of offshore wind port area. This is a detailed uh, information of port area. Uh, high uh, price, uh, 36 Japanese yen by kilowatt hour in the old data, uh, coming uh, due to old data. This is the exact picture. Uh, we are, they are now uh, constructing this uh, offshore wind like that. Uh, yes, this is also. And now uh, the government is, uh, is managing the uh, tender, uh, uh, making tender round one, round two, and the next formation. So many areas of offshore wind and uh, tender. Yes, it's a little, uh, we miss a uh, cut the, this part. Anyway, the uh, tender in the round one, uh, Mitsubishi Shoji uh, occupied all, all three areas. Uh, and now uh, we are under the round two auction, tender started. And uh, this is the uh, uh, first uh, round one result, something like that. Later, please, in YouTube, you can see the exact number of uh, exact uh, retail data. Uh, this is uh, now the first uh, uh, construction of the uh, general sea area in Nagasaki. Accidentally, the first 
offshore wind in the uh, general sea area is a floating type, floating type. The another, uh, the second round two is here, yes. Now so many candidates, so many uh, under uh, the construction in the general sea area on the offshore. So now uh, offshore wind is one of the key technology for the reconstruction of Japan after the disaster. Uh, and the government is also eager to develop uh, offshore wind. And uh, what, what shall I say? Uh, but we should cooperate with local people for the development of ocean energy, such as uh, fish, Fishermen's Union and uh, some sensitive people for environmental uh, impact assessment. Uh, so otherwise, there is some possibility to extend nuclear power again for carbon neutral in Japan. Please expect and join us, uh, future offshore wind of giant size in Japan. Thank you very much for your kind uh, uh, hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuichi, for this uh, comprehensive overview. And uh, when I look at the times and the, the the targets, then it seems that things are now starting really to develop, or hopefully on a large scale, um, especially as there is, of course, also already international collaboration about this. And again, uh, the G7 just held a meeting in Japan where uh, I, I understand that's been initiated to some degree by Japan, uh, there's been an, a, a joint target agreed by all the G7 countries um, explicitly for offshore wind, which I believe they should have been mentioning also onshore wind, but I think it's good uh, news, especially from the from that angle that you just presented. So um, do we see any questions here? I don't see that. So again, thanks so much and uh, a very good evening. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your perspective, then we would uh, stay in Asia, but uh, now go to what we've just learned these days, the, in terms of population, largest country of our planet. And that is now, um, sorry for our Chinese colleagues, uh, as we hear, China is the leader in wind power without doubt. In terms of population, um, India is now the number one that is just obviously a few days old. And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Chami Hossein, uh, who is the technical chair of our association, but who's been working um, on wind power in India for uh, 30 years and longer in different perspectives from associations, also from companies. And Chami, I uh, have the pleasure to invite you now, uh, give you the floor to present the status of India. Thank you, Stephen, and good morning, good afternoon, and. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so yeah, good that uh, Stephen, you pointed out that uh, India is now the uh, largest country in terms of population, but a uh, lot of population now, but I still feel the same as I was feeling earlier. And uh, yeah, uh, so have you given me the option to- Continue with Pakistan and then go back to India. Um, now then, Okay, let me introduce uh, Mr. Muhammad Bazad Gauri. Uh, my great pleasure to welcome you here. Um, you're here joining us from the company Renewables First, which has been created by uh, one of our long-term partners in Pakistan. We've been working uh, many years um, in Pakistan with our uh, team there, and uh, we've uh, been working also with the government, and it's my pleasure now to welcome you and hand over to you to give us an idea of the development, most recent developments of the wind power market in Pakistan. Uh, thank you so much, Stefan. Um, thank you for um, introducing that. And uh, before I start off, I just want to make sure I'm audible and you can see my screen. Is yes, that right? all looks perfect. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I'll just quickly go over, um, you know, the developments within Pakistan in the wind power sector. And 
uh, you know, we've heard a lot about from the a lot of capacity additions within China um, and within India as well. Um, Pakistan comparatively being a nascent stage, but has really taken off in past decade within this particular wind sector. Um, so we'll just go over a few of the things. Um, so before I delve into it, just wanted to introduce our organization, Renewables First. So basically, we are a think tank based in Pakistan. Um, we are driving towards energy transition, and we do that uh, through impactful research, advocacy, and strategic partnerships, uh, focusing mainly on inclusivity and the immediate action. So that is something that we are focusing upon. Um, so before uh, entering into the current status, I just wanted to go over uh, the resource potential that exists within Pakistan. And when we see here, uh, we have uh, about 346 gigawatt of wind power project as per some studies um, uh, uh, of the potential that's mostly situated within the southern regions of Pakistan. So there are two provinces, Sindh and Balochistan. Um, so within the Sindh region, and that's the southern part you can see here, if you can see my arrow. So that's basically where we have our landmark uh, Jhim Gharo wind corridor. And currently all the Pakistan's wind farms are installed within this a corridor which has potential uh, different studies site from 40 gigawatt up to uh, 60 gigawatt within this one single corridor. So we have quite an ideal site uh, and we'll discuss this later as well that uh, it's also very close to the load as uh, load center and a metropolitan Karachi. Um, on the other hand, there are pockets of um, uh, uh, wind sites uh, in the western region of Balochistan, but they remain untapped up till now, uh, mainly because of uh, lack of access to uh, reliable grid infrastructure there. And plus the major load centers are far away uh, from that site. So these are a couple of constraints due to which those sites haven't been developed as well. Um, and then uh, when we talk about this particular corridor that houses all the wind power plants, what's really astonishing is that it actually aligns really well with the load demand uh, within the nearby metropolitan Karachi. So you can see here that uh, the curves of the average uh, load demand on uh, average day that quite well aligns and is synchronous to the um, output, wind power output uh, of this corridor. Um, and why this is particularly important in context of Pakistan is basically we have uh, a peak load requirement of only about 28,000 megawatt, uh, but we have a surplus capacity that we have to install uh, going up to more than 40 uh, gigawatts. So they're, they're, uh, for every um, uh, uh, addition into the load, we have a lot of capacity that needs to be added. There are several reasons for that due to the uh, transmission constraints uh, and the transmission network mainly. Uh, but uh, this is definitely crucial and uh, wind gives uh, one of the key uh, leverage in order to shave off this peak uh, to make this whole sector more financially viable. And um, uh, as it's shown here as well, it kind of takes off around about in the afternoon and peaking off in the evening. Um, that's completely complementing towards the solar profile, daily solar profile as well. So they're just talking about a little bit of opportunities uh, that exist within Pakistan. So in terms of uh, the overall evolution of wind energy sector um, within Pakistan, it started off in 2006 when we had a first policy uh, that gave a framework for deploying uh, wind power projects. And after uh, seven years, we had our first commissioning of the first wind power projects within the Jhimpir Gharo corridor. Um, followed by which we had a power policy which, which expedited many of the uh, other wind projects that were in pipeline. Um, in 2016, we had this landmark financing scheme that was launched, uh, which uh, offered, uh, which was offered by the government, um, giving concessional financing at the rate of about six percent for for all the RE projects, solar and wind, going up to 50 megawatt. So we see a lot of uh, interest into this um, uh, wind power after this uh, financing scheme. Um, after that, in 2019, uh, for the first time, Pakistan set very tangible targets for the renewable addition um, bounded by the policy. So we had 30% share of renewables by 2030 and 60% by 2047. Um, that was made in 2019 and all the procurements were um, are to be done uh, through the auctions mechanism as uh, compared to the conventional uh, public procurement methods. 
Um, after that, we had a integrated generation capacity expansion plan. So this is a plan we'll discuss later as well. It's basically a least cost plan. So for every uh, capacity additions uh, in upcoming years in Pakistan are defined by this plan. Um, so which essentially states that the least uh, cost technology should be induced first. Um, so even that plan and the modeling results in 60% uh, capacity of renewables, um, solar, wind, and hydro, in fact, um, that goes up to 60% by 2030. Um, then we had national electricity policy uh, that uh, impacted towards, that goes towards energy affordability, energy security, energy sustainability. So three tiers based on which our generation expansion was defined. Uh, and just last year, um, one of the key landmark achievements within this whole wind energy sector was for the first time we had a, a local um, uh, solutions factory launched by the Goldwind, uh, which was a step towards localizing the O&M uh, O facilities for the wind power plants. Because uh, before this, um, nearly everything from part procurements to running the facilities uh, was outsourced to the uh, overseas. So low, in terms of localization of the value chain, that was a key step to towards it. So coming towards the power market overview, um, uh, as already told you that the total capacity of Pakistan is comparatively smaller. Uh, we have about 41 gigawatt um, installed capacity and demand of only about 28 gigawatt. And as you can see in the graph below, we have um, uh, the wind um, uh, started off in 2013. Um, right now it has a share of about 5% in terms of the overall installed capacity followed by uh, within the renewables followed by solar, which is about 1% capacity. So um, even though uh, it has taken off, uh, there's a, still in terms of the potential that there is to put a wind into the grid, uh, there's a lot of opportunity that is yet to be materialized. Uh, so coming towards the wind power market, uh, you can see for the past 10 years here, uh, the capacity additions within the wind uh, have been uh, increasing. Um, however, and we have installed about two gigawatt of capacity. Um, however, we see that uh, that we had a surplus capacity issue back in 2019 and there were delays pertaining to COVID in 2020 onwards. Um, so that kind of like subdued uh, development of wind power projects. But after that, in 2022, we also see addition of um, a lot of wind power projects within the grid. Uh, so that's, that's a good indication uh, for Pakistan as well. So this is basically the IG sub that I was uh, talking about, uh, the plan that defines how the new capacity additions are installed within Pakistan. And as you can see, uh, in terms of the latest IDCEP that has been revealed uh, last year, uh, we have about almost reaching up to seven gigawatt additions um, within the next 10 years, uh, which is uh, uh, you know more than uh, uh, almost triple of current um, capacity. Um, however, uh, since there was a lot of developments in renewables, we see that most of the um, additions are towards solar as well. Uh, so even though it's a good news uh, for the higher integration of renewables within uh, the uh, power sector, uh, but it's mostly based on the um, uh, solar followed by a little bit chunk of wind. Uh, and I should mention here that it's uh, uh, the solar addition also includes the net metering that needs to be added. So they have about 480 megawatt on annual basis. So this is the most interesting thing that uh, I feel Pakistan has achieved over the past decade. Um, and when we see at the levelized uh, cost of wind energy, we see that um, it has reduced by about 78% uh, in terms of cents per kilowatt hour. And that, that's a big number when it comes to, uh, you know, in terms of maturity of market uh, within the Pakistan. And the, the reason for this number is basically driven by the contraction of the uh, EPC cost uh, during the same time, which is contracted by 60%. And there are three major reasons due to which that has happened. So we had declining cost of finance. Um, as I told you, uh, we had a financing scheme and subsidies also provided by the government. Then we had market maturity uh, with time a lot of wind power projects were installed and then the as uh, the more and more projects were installed and the risks became lower uh, the roi required also was lowered um, from 20 percent down to uh, now lower than 15 percent um, so these are the things that drove this levelized tariff uh, 
very low and lately last tariff that was uh, issued was about 3.25 cents in 2020 uh, these projects haven't materialized yet uh, partly because they were issued a tariff under a different regime uh, and now uh, they have to compete through an auction mechanism after ARE 2019 policy um, so they're yet to be materialized uh, but having said that, Pakistan has achieved substantial cost reduction, um, but uh, uh, these, it, it's very difficult to expect that it's the trend is going to be continued because they have already reduced drastically over the past years. So that is uh, something uh, uh, you know, uh, of value here as well. Ten minutes are over. Thank you, Martina. Um, so in terms of drivers and barriers, I would more focus towards the barriers currently that exist towards uh, integration of this wind power project. So firstly, we have an issue of surplus capacity that we've already discussed. Um, then there's an issue of locking of investment within the coal projects and RLNG pipelines. So we have relatively newer uh, fleet of coal power projects, only about five to seven years old. So based on that, uh, there's a lot of demand that's already locked in through those projects, leaving a little bit room for the uh, renewables, uh, very little share for the renewables to take part in. Uh, then we have a great constraints, although we have a lot of uh, 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 targets in terms of policy, 60 and 30% renewables, they have been indication by a transmission authority that our grid might not be suitable for that. So there are definitely bottlenecks related to the grid uh, as well. Uh, uh, then the policy delays and mismatch as discussed earlier um, there are several times the policies changed over the past 10 years um, they were for instance there were projects uh, that were promised a tariff uh, uh, based on uh, uh, 2015 and 20 uh, and after the 2019 policy came upon they have to convert already the tariff was issued and they had to convert towards uh, uh, the auction mechanism as well so such kind of policy delays and mismatch also impacts investor uh, confidence then political instability for past one year we had a lot of political volatility uh, within the country which have kind of like put a very uh, uh, big period on any new project developments as well um, this is one of the key good news for Pakistan, the localization of wind value chain as discussed in last uh, year in December, Goldwind launched the solution factory. Um, so the first time we had a warehousing of spare parts facility, uh, which could also supply uh, globally. And then uh, after sales maintenance and retrofit facility within Pakistan. So that was one of the key achievements. So lastly, in terms of opportunity, uh, where, where we see a lot of constraints, as we discussed earlier, uh, there's also uh, an opportunity here that Pakistan is moving towards a wholesale electricity market. So at the, at the first step, they are launching the bilateral competitive market. Um, actually, they have launched it, and it's in testing phase. Uh, it's a bilateral competitive market, which is uh, to allow the uh, consumers, buyers, and the uh, generators to engage into, directly engage into um, uh, uh, a market for procuring electricity um, and it's available for any BPC uh, that uh, can have that can procure more than one megawatt of electricity so that's one particular area where there is definitely a lot of opportunity uh, for the wind power projects and all the overall the renewable technologies to uh, take part in because you can essentially bypass a lot of constraints uh, due to that and this is just last thing that I wanted to discuss upon because we focus a lot on a lot about the social development that accompanies uh, with these renewable projects. So we had one of our partners um, uh, do this uh, uh, survey that they did at Jhimpir Garo where all the wind farms are uh, with the local community about how these projects have impacted their life. And there are four main key insights uh, when it comes to the local context of Pakistan that has originated, um, uh, that what happens when these projects are installed there. Uh, number one is basically the infrastructure development. That's a direct outcome of the wind power project. So you had roads which were never built there. So you had access to the cities uh, for the local communities living in uh, dwellings. Uh, so that's one of the key outcomes of that, uh, of the wind power projects. Uh, then there was enhanced uh, economic growth. So a lot of skilled jobs were developed uh, for the people. Um, and then there was also one key issue that we often face within Pakistan is that we realize that uh, within these wind power projects in order, in order to completely materialize 
um, its maximum benefit. Um, uh, there were a lot of CSR initiatives uh, by these uh, wind develop wind power producers as well. Um, but in order to fully materialize these benefits, it must be complemented by the government efforts uh, because there are a lot of uh, uh, issues that are uh, that need government interventions, and the private sector can do so much. Um, lastly, one of the major outcome that we see that there's a lot of gender mainstreaming that is being done within the whole over renewable energy sector. But when it comes to placing um, um, females and women on plant uh, for the uh, scaled uh, labor, um, that that's one of the biggest issue for them is basically the security situation. So in order um, to uh, mainstream the gender within the whole wind power situation, it's very much necessary to um, address the security situation of the region as well. So with that, um, I would say thank you. And if there are any questions, uh, Stefan, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that was, uh, I think, a very good introduction of uh, compared to, uh, of course, what we heard, for example, from China, a not so big market, but a very dynamic market. And I think uh, it's very clear that the importance of renewables in, in Pakistan, especially in the light of the global energy crisis, is becoming even clearer. And let me also mention that it's, of course, impressive to see the cost decretion that you had um, with a 78%. And obviously, policymakers uh, were not really so smart saying that we are giving up on that cost digression by introducing now a new scheme, which may not see the same uh, low cost as you just highlighted. I don't see any questions for you, but they may come up here. And I would like to invite again everyone to also write your questions in the chat. So thanks again. And uh, then um, let's go back to Chami, Chami Hossein. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see you back. Um, and we would then continue with your presentation about the Indian uh, wind power market. Chami, welcome back. And uh, please, uh, again, take over and share your screen. So that looks good, indeed better than before, because we see the full screen mode. I just don't hear you so far. So if you just say at least a word. Yeah. So uh, I'm very sorry. There, there was some technical hitch and due to which I just got knocked out of the uh, Zoom. And uh, uh, just for continuity, because I was just on slide number two, so I will just begin from the beginning. Uh, uh, I was making a presentation on, uh, you know, developments of wind power in 2023 in India. And uh, uh, just a minute. Yeah. And uh, uh, as you see in this graph, uh, I've shown the development that have taken place in uh, 2022, 23, uh, and compared to uh, the latest developments uh, last year versus this year. And uh, this is also statewide. So you can see the installations that have taken place uh, uh, in each of the states uh, during the year. And the axis on the y axis on the right side will give you the uh, installations for the uh, yellow bars, which show the installations in each, uh, each state. And on the left uh, hand side uh, axis, we have the cumulative installations of, for the uh, year 2022 and 23. And uh, you can see there is an uh, uh, increase in installations in. Uh, Gujarat and uh, Rajasthan and uh, much less in other, other states. So uh, that is the status. Uh, there are different kinds of models which are being uh, uh, tried out and uh, implemented uh, with regard to wind. These are also in combination with solar, with battery storage, uh, pure wind only uh, and uh, there are uh, captives and third party sales. And also you combine wind uh, sometimes with the conventional power to provide around the clock power. And these are very interesting uh, kind of frameworks where you know you are able to use renewable energy to supply firm power because that's what the uh, uh, utilities uh, want all the time. So uh, these are very interesting developments require a lot of uh, complex analysis uh, sometimes. So uh, there are a lot of uh, complex things happening on the ground 
to bring about these projects uh, into uh, you know uh, into operation so uh, another part of the uh, status that we have uh, just to inform you that nearly 10 gigawatt capacity has been added since the options regime was initiated in 2017 and uh, before that uh, we had uh, uh, you know the fit uh, regime so this is a very uh, reasonably uh, good capacity i mean 10 gigawatt uh, but over the last uh, uh, 5 6 years and uh, so far, nearly 22 gigawatt of uh, wind may have been optioned because it is also optioned not only as purely wind, but also in combination with solar, wind, and round the clock, these kind of things that I mentioned. So oh, we uh, you know, judge that uh, approximately 22 uh, gigawatt of uh, wind may have been optioned. Now, uh, very recently, a uh, trajectory of uh, uh, renewable energy, 50 gigawatt bidding trajectory has been announced for the year 2023-24, very large capacity. And out of that, pure wind is uh, 10 gigawatt. And uh, so 10 gigawatt will be auctioned this year, which will be pure wind. But when, then again, when we look at hybrids and uh, RTC, solar, which will account for uh, 40 gigawatt, we'll also have a certain component of wind in that. So we may think that uh, roughly you know, 15, uh, 15 or 18 gigawatt of uh, uh, wind uh, uh, wind capacity uh, will be included in the overall uh, total options in this year. There is also a lot of development on the offshore front, and uh, but so far uh, no uh, bidding has taken place. It's almost about to happen and uh, of course we always say that uh, it's likely to happen in the next few months but uh, we do hope that now uh, uh, this will happen there is a strategy document that has been released by the ministry that uh, plans to uh, you know have the options for uh, roughly 37 gigawatt of offshore projects uh, uh, by 2030 and uh, there are different kinds of models that are proposed one of them, of course, similar to onshore uh, options where you supply electricity to the utility. But there are other models where, you know, uh, the developers have to take the seabed on a lease and then uh, uh, they find out how they supply electricity to whom and uh, I mean, work out their own uh, arrangements. A uh, lot of international companies, uh, very big players uh, from UK, Denmark, other places, uh, uh, all the large players are very keen and very seriously looking at this uh, market. And uh, what's probably holding it up a little bit is that uh, at the moment, there is no real ecosystem for offshore projects. So a lot of feasibility studies have been done for Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, and that is where these projects are likely to come up. But uh, that ecosystem, so once the first projects or the first activities get going, then uh, I look at uh, uh, some of the regions of India becoming a hub for offshore, most probably the Tamil Nadu area where already the lot of manufacturing and uh, such things uh, are centered. So this is something big which can happen in a year or two uh, now. Coming back to my usual graph, which I show every time and uh, this is the trend in installations uh, and we are in 2023 and uh, something like uh, oh, more than 42 gigawatt of uh, capacity has been set up. And uh, this is the trends in uh, annual installations. So you see the big uh, uh, spike in 2017 when the uh, FIT regime had ended and after that we have the options regime. So uh, as I said now nearly 22 gigawatt uh, have been optioned out of which 10 gigawatt have come up. So another 10 to 12 uh, uh, gigawatt has to come up over the next uh, uh, one or two years. Uh, uh, so this capacity will go up. And also projects are coming up outside the option regime. 
uh, in, under different policy mechanisms. There is a hybrid policy in Gujarat. And uh, similarly, there are uh, you know, captive projects uh, in different states to some extent, but these are uh, relatively much smaller uh, uh, projects. Jeremy, you have five minutes left. Yeah. So you can see the growth rate, uh, which is in the, uh, you know, uh, the dash, uh, red dash line, uh, year to year growth. And uh, as you can see in the first few years, the growth is, uh, happens to be very high and then it comes down because the cumulative capacity keeps on adding. Uh, this shows the trends in generation mix because uh, uh, we have other uh, generation capacities. Uh, so this is from 16, 17 till 2023. And the large uh, blue tower that you see uh, is the total capacity. And we have now more than 400 gigawatt installed capacity in India total from all sources. And uh, out of that, uh, the red, this red line is showing you uh, uh, the percentage of wind, how it has been rising vis-a-vis -vis the total installed capacity. And we are now at something like 10.25 uh, or 10 point something like that, uh, percentage uh, in terms of installed capacity of wind. And uh, the other towers here are uh, thermal, nuclear, hydro, uh, total RE and uh, you know, uh, the wind, uh, you can see these, these are smaller ones, right? These are uh, auctions. Uh, I have at least till 2022, which have taken place. And as I told you now, something like 22 gigawatt uh, must have been in uh, auction. And uh, this one uh, shows only uh, around 14 gigawatt. Uh, every year. Uh, these are the round the power and hybrid kind of, which is another uh, eight gigawatt, which has been optioned uh, till 2020. And uh, more must have been done in 22, 23, for those figures can be there, but this is how it is. Uh, the technology has been changing in India and uh, we uh, earlier used to have uh, Two megawatt and you know the other important thing that is happening with wind turbines is that the tower heights the hub heights and the uh, rotor diameter is increasing quite significantly and uh, uh, but the rated capacity is more or less uh, uh, not not increasing at the same rate so this means that uh, the machines are becoming more and more optimal for uh, uh, mediocre wind speed uh, regions or low wind speed regions. So even in uh, areas where earlier we were uh, looking at plant load factors of 18% or something like that, we now uh, work out something like 40%, 36% plant load factor in many large areas of uh, you know of the country. So this is because of the technology that has uh, changed, and uh, you can see the uh, square meter per megawatt is uh, is uh, uh, shown within the circle. So uh, this circle shows uh, more or less what is the predominant technology type in the country today. The other ones probably have been phased out. So this is what is happening now. We have uh, machines being offered in uh, three to three point three. Or now there is also. Uh, wind turbine of 4.2 megawatt or something like that, uh, tested very recently. So this evolution also means uh, that there is uh, more and more uh, you know, energy generation that will happen uh, from the wind. In this context, I would al also like to say that if, the, if and when this offshore comes up uh, and if it is combined with solar, the plant load factors uh, will increase quite uh, significantly to uh, 55, 60 percent, which is almost like a thermal power plant. So uh, there we see that the renewable energy is uh, very significantly, uh, not in not only in cost terms but also technically and uh, uh, power system wise, uh, competing uh, very strongly with the thermal power. So this is my last slide. Thank you.
ओके ओके सॉरी सो दिस वाज ऑलरेडी योर लास्ट स्लाइड सो थैंक यू वेरी मच शामी फॉर शोइंग अस द द वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग डेवलपमेंट ऑफ कोर्स ऑफ द इंडियन विंड पावर मार्केट इन इंडिया व्हिच वाज वन ऑफ द द द फर्स्ट कंट्रीज व्हिच इंस्टॉल्ड ऑफ कोर्स ऑन अ लार्ज स्केल एंड ऑफ कोर्स नाउ even more important how to cover the the energy needs of the the largest population of of all countries uh, around the world so do we have any questions for chami i don't see that at the moment again please feel free to use the chat and uh, raise your questions if you have any then uh, i would say again thank you very much uh, dear chami for presenting the the update from india and giving us your insights very interesting perspective and uh, now we move on and we are now um, inviting the first european country it's my great pleasure to welcome um, galina schmidt um, dear galina you are one of those drivers of uh, renewable energy for many years in particular wind power in ukraine um also one of the board members vice president of the world wind energy association and of course we are all aware that ukraine is now in a special situation because of the uh, the war the russian invasion that started last year uh, but um of course we also know that uh, there's been an encouraging development of wind power uh, last year and we also know that uh, with the help of renewables that of course uh, we are sure Uh, makes it easier to cover the needs of all countries around the world so galina uh, welcome to you and i would like to invite you now to speak yeah uh, thank you stefan very much uh, do you hear me yes yes okay so thank you uh, thank you for organizing this very important uh, webinar as usually at least once a year we let's say summarize the wind development all around the world and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, the wind market of ukraine uh, martina next slide please uh, so uh, as of the end of 2022 there were 35 wind farms in ukraine more than 3.5 billion euros have been in, already invested in wind projects in ukraine and uh, despite the war almost 82 megawatt of wind capacity were added in 2022 bringing the cumulative total to almost 1.75 gigawatt for sure comparing so uh, chinese and indian market and pakistan market uh, i am now mentioning quite uh, a modest figures but uh, again i'd like to draw, draw your attention that we continue to developing uh, wind pr uh, projects even in war times next slide please yes Uh, today i can say with certainty that all modern wars are in one way or another connected to the bloody business of fossil fuels one of the most striking examples of this is putin's war against ukraine which is financed by excess profit generated from sale of fossil fuels first of all to the european countries Russia's attempt to blackmail Ukraine over gas supply have proved that no country today will ever be safe until it becomes energy independent and the pathway to energy independence is based on renewables homegrown energy sources wind is instrumental to our energy security to tackling climate change wind brings democracy independence and peace the full scale military aggression by russian federation has a massive and destructive impact on energy sector of ukraine more than 35000 facilities in ukraine have been destroyed as a result of russian attacks 
so almost 30,000 uh, attacks were recorded since the invasion. Relentless attacks on Ukrainian energy infrastructure has cost over 10 billion dollars in damages and left over 12 million people with no or limited electricity, according to the recently published energy damage assessments from the United Nations Development Program and the World Bank. Taking a chance, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to all people all around the world, to governments for the strong and continued support for staying with us from the first days of this horrible barbaric invasion. We greatly appreciate the humanitarian aid ranging from medical supplies to energy equipment we received from you. Unfortunately, almost uh, half of uh, energy system of Ukraine was uh, destroyed due to this restless Russia's missiles attacks. Next slide, please. But uh, coming back to the renewables in Ukraine, the total installed capacity of all renewable energy facilities at the end of 2022 reached 9.94 gigawatt. Russia's aggression and temporary occupation of some territories of Ukraine deprived the country of a significant part of the green generation. The majority of utility scale renewable power plants, about 60% of solar plants, and more than 85% of wind plants are concentrated in the southern and southeastern regions of Ukraine where natural conditions for wind and solar power are the most favorable. Why I draw your attention to this fact? Because unfortunately, the southern part of Ukraine uh, was occupied by Russian uh, invaders from the first months of uh, this horrible war. And here you see the photo of uh, one of destroyed uh, solar farm in, uh, in the south of Ukraine. In total, as of the end of 2022, 22.7% 20, uh, of solar and wind power capacities have been damaged or stopped. This chart shows you the volume of capacity which are now currently in operation and those being stopped. Renewable capacity which are uh, under operation are marked in blue figures and uh, in red uh, capacities that have been stopped or damaged. In general, in 2022, generation of electricity from renewables decreased by a third. Next slide, please. According to our uh, uh, prognosis uh, that we made at the end of 2021, in 2022, we expected at least 1,000 megawatt of new wind power additions. And uh, moreover, about 4,000 megawatt of wind power capacity have re uh, had received building permits. But uh, the war put wind projects that were already in development and construction phase on hold. Moreover, because of safety reasons, wind capacity uh, companies had to shut down the wind farms located in the territories occupied by Russian troops. And first of all, due to this uh, security reason of the personals. In general, about 75% of wind capacity or 1,317 megawatt are currently out of operation. And here you also see the photos of uh, wind farms heated by uh, Russian uh, guns, by Russian uh, rockets. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, just to add some words about the photos that you see on the previous slide, that right now we know at least 10 wind turbines 
several transmission lines and substations being damaged or destroyed in the course of the war. But for sure, the real number could be higher because uh, right now uh, we have no access to the wind sites located in the occupied territories. According to the preliminary estimate of losses from destroyed damage or stolen wind farms e equipment exceeds 50 million euros. Another 500 million euros was lost due to the forced downtown of wind farms. But these figures are related to the end of 2022. So unfortunately, the war is uh, still going on. And uh, as I have already mentioned, these figures would be higher. But now some positive news. So uh, the Ukrainian wind power sector works hard to contribute to strengthening our country independence. And despite, I'm so sorry, one second. Yeah, and uh, uh, despite the war, the construction of wind farms keeps going, though at a slow pace. Uh, this year, in the middle of March, uh, we uh, finished the construction of 114 megawatt Telegulska wind farm. Uh, it's also in the southern part of Ukraine, in Mykolaiv region, but the territory that under Ukraine's control. Uh, 19 uh, wind turbine with unit capacity of 6 megawatt. Uh, were brought online under some of the most challenging conditions anywhere in the world, just 97 kilometers from the front line of the war with Russia. 10 minutes are over. Uh, this uh, first phase of 500 megawatt wind farm in Megalayev region, and it's proved the availability of wind energy technology, the availability of renewables. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Martina. So uh, just uh, to give you some short information about our future plans uh, that have been already drafted and we expect to be uh, approved still in summer. Uh, the first one is the National Renewable Energy Action Plan till 2030 sets a new goal of increasing the share of energy from renewable in gross final energy consumption by three times from 9% in 2020 to 27% in 2030. And uh, um, as for the wind capacities, it should be increased by 3.7 gigawatt, totaling up to 5.7 four gigawatt in 2030. And another document is draft Ukraine's recovery plan. Uh, it provides for from five to 10 gigawatt of wind and solar additions by 2032, and uh, additionally plus 30 gigawatt of rest capacities for hydrogen production. They have a centralized energy system that Ukraine inherited from the Soviet Union makes us vulnerable to Russian attacks. Therefore, instead of building back the fossil fuel energy centralized energy system, post-war recovery and reconstruction of Ukraine should be based on renewables. Decentralized energy system is less vulnerable to enemy attacks. It means sustainable, reliable energy supply in all regions that do not depend solely on the operation of powerful nuclear or thermal power plant. And for sure, in, we indeed have no other alternatives. Next slide, please. Uh, just to show you the map of uh, offshore wind potential in Ukraine. The study was conducted by World Bank, and according to it, the theoretical potential of 20 of 250 gigawatt uh, is available in Ukraine. We are just at the very, very beginning of, let's say, discussing possibilities of developing offshore wind projects in Ukraine, but I'm happy to tell you 
that at least we have started to think about uh, this uh, another technologies for Ukraine. Next slide, please. So what we need to accelerate when deployment uh, in Ukraine? Uh, first of all, to define at the legislative level the expansion of wind power and other renewables as a matter of overriding public interest. To set up clear short-term by 2025 medium-term and long-term targets for wind energy deployment in Ukraine. By the way, um, recently our Minister of Energy announced the vision of uh, energy system of Ukraine by 2050. And according to this vision, 50% of uh, energy mix should be covered by renewables with wind uh, at its core. So we also need, as I have already said, we are at the very beginning of offshore uh, development in Ukraine. So we need to draft and adopt offshore wind legislations and uh, legislations for hybrid renewable power plants. And, and, uh, recently, the draft law on guarantees of origin has been registered with the parliament. So we also need to introduce it as quick uh, as possible. Uh, next slide, please. And just a few words about renewables for Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has broadened our association's activity, and I'm pretty sure that all of you know that World Wind Energy Association and Global's 100% Renewable Energy Platform launched the campaign Renewables for Ukraine to raise funds to donating renewable energy equipment for emergency humanitarian aid in Ukraine. Our, uh, we as Ukrainian Wind Energy Association also participated in this campaign and uh, helped to organize deliveries. Uh, here you see uh, photos from a mobile solar system that have been delivered to one of the most uh, affected by Russian aggression uh, town in Kyiv region in Irpin. So the two systems were delivered on uh, 26 of December 2022 and uh, for hospitals. And uh, in March 2023, another two systems were delivered. And this time, one of the systems were delivered to Irpin Lyceum of Innovating Technologies. Uh, this is the photo on the right. So this is briefly what I was planning to tell you, and maybe the last, uh, next slide, Martina, please. So just uh, our publications, each year we issue the uh, wind market uh, over you. And as you see, our last editions, uh, we call it wind market in wartime. And the next slide. Just again, I would like to stress that wind energy is the energy of freedom and independence. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much, uh, um, Galina, for joining us in particular for the last message. I think that is really the, the summary even, I would say, of today's uh, webinar, how important it is to have wind energy, that we use wind energy. Indeed, uh, I believe that we all share the uh, the wish that this war ends soon, the destruction ends soon, and it's heartbreaking to see how also renewable energy installations have been destroyed, aside from, of course, all those uh, human uh, tragedies that we know are happening. Um, it's nice to see that you have the good news that there are, even under today's uh, conditions, that there is new installations and of course, as World Wind Energy Association, we've been able to, to support what you just highlighted, the humanitarian aid. And uh, that is still ongoing. And we're getting requests from people from around the world who want to support the people in Ukraine directly with the uh, uh, securing the power supply. So thank you. Um, thank you. I don't see at the moment again any direct questions for you, um, which means... 
that uh, again, those of you who have questions, you can also type them in the in the chat here. Uh, but then again, thank you. I understand that you're at the moment you're not in Ukraine because you're traveling in uh, I think in Denmark. Um, safe trip back, and uh, then uh, we would uh, yeah, thank go you. to another country which is not so far from where you are, which is the final presentation for this first session of our Wind Power Around the World. Uh, webinar and it's my pleasure now to welcome our next speaker uh, Mr. Andreas Wickman from the Swedish Wind Power Association uh, Sweden um, which has become yeah one of the largest markets for wind turbines in 2022 although by population of course uh, far away from being one of the largest countries in Europe but the wind market in uh, 2022 ob obviously went well. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to Andreas. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I hope you all can hear me. Yes. I'm, uh, and uh, yes, we have seen a remarkable uh, race in, uh, in uh, installing wind in Sweden during the last uh, or five years, which I will um, show you on my slides. Uh, we we started uh, the, as many of the other countries also in the early 90s, late 80s, uh, but uh, the development was very slow. Uh, well, of course, partly due to that the turbines were also very small. So even if the number of turbines grow, the, the number of megawatt was slow. So. But now we have another situation. So now I will try to share my screen. See if that can be the case here. Uh, it should be this one. Um, should I double click? Uh, okay, does it that work? Looks very good, yes. Fine. Uh, so uh, my presentation, uh, uh, which I have been provided uh, with from, from our, say, sister organization. We have two wind organizations in Sweden. We, uh, we are cooperating. Uh, and um, uh, Swedish Wind Energy Association, we, our, name, our name is Swedish Wind Power Association, so it's quite similar. Uh, they are um, uh, working hardly to, uh, to update uh, the statistics, um, which are doing very well. So uh, we asked them for the, their latest figures and uh, we got them. So uh, this is what I will present. Uh, so I go to the next slide here. Uh, well, I can say before that the, the, the figures are, uh, are uh, very firm because they are directed from the manufacturers and, and the investors uh, according to the uh, the numbers that are for uh, projects uh, under construction or that are signed and will definitely be constructed. Then when it comes to uh, uh, longer forecasts, uh, we have to rely on uh, uh, the statistics of how, how project under permitting or just permitted projects that have uh, well received a pro the, the permit but not yet the investment decisions we we have uh, the statistics to see how many percentage of those that will come into operations but uh, that will be explained further on in, in the presentation so uh aha doesn't change oh i don't know why it, why it doesn't well there have something else uh, this is uh, the last uh, seven, eight years where the, the, the red line uh, is, uh, we, we, the, the statistic is gathered every quarter. So for one year, we will have four, say, uh, data dots. Uh, that's why it looks like uh, this a little bit hilly. Uh, but the thin uh, gray line uh, is uh, also uh, produced uh, every quarter, but it's the, the average of the last four uh, quarters. So you can see that we, for, a, for a couple of years here, since, since uh, four or five years, we have had around 
500 megawatt uh, each quarter, uh, which gives us uh, 2000 megawatt a year uh, installation. But it has uh, unfortunately dropped a little uh, the last year. Uh, uh, but we have a good reason to, to believe that it will recover uh, at least uh, uh, du during 23 and 24. But then again, it looks a little bit uh, uh, lower. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the same, but in, in uh, more clean figures, where you can see that last year we uh, uh, got just over 2000 megawatt installed uh, and uh, during this year this is uh, the the 100 percent for sure figures which will give us also uh, over 2000 megawatt you can see in the square where it says 2023 total and for what we know for sure at present during the two years to come uh, after this you can see it, it's uh, m much lower. Uh, in, in Sweden, we have uh, four different price areas, uh, which is, um, the, the, the price is different a lot, really, uh, where, where the, the most southern part of uh, Sweden, which is called SE4, have, have uh, electricity prices uh, that is strongly connected to Germany and Denmark. Uh, SC3 is uh, also quite dependent, uh, while SC2 and SC1 uh, is uh, in, an, uh, well, one can say completely other division according to pricing. Uh, at least uh, it has been so, and it's, it's because of the grid transitions, uh, there are bottlenecks and bottle, bottlenecks uh, because the, the areas uh, in the northern part, uh, they are, uh, uh, it's much easier to find uh, uh, not so populated areas in the northern part. So there, the, 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 the most turbines uh, are uh, erected in that part of Sweden. Uh, which means that, uh, but, but but while the consumption, uh, at least up till now, have been uh, much much higher in the southern part, but uh, due to uh, uh, an extremely strong industrial uh, expansion in the northern part, uh, it, we have uh, Europe's largest uh, battery factory. Uh, 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 building a, a bit built up there, uh, and it, 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 I think it partly is in production already, and it will grow further on. And also, the steel industry is going to go fossil fuel free, uh, uh, which means that they need uh, a large amount of electricity instead for uh, for um, uh, their production. So uh, the the uh, the possibility to uh, export a uh, lot of uh, energy down further south will uh, decrease uh, while the consumption uh, race in the northern part of the country. So the, 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 the four uh, staples here uh, is for each of these uh, areas uh, and, and uh, the, the different colors in each staple is for the different years. So here, here we have uh, 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 last year, 2022, which is the dark, well, blue or whatever color it is. Uh, next uh, is 23, is the the the, the uh, light gray or mid medium gray, and, and then we have uh, 24 and 25. <laughs> And you can see it's signed the contract. So these these will happen, and hopefully uh, there will be some adders to to the the numbers in the, the later year here. And if you go to uh, the short term forecast here, we have uh, we will see a continued a uh, high expansion in twenty three. Uh, uh, and, and but after 24, it looks like it will uh, slow down. Uh, 
uh, accumulated it, we, we, we have uh, the, the forecast that we will have reached an installed capacity of uh, 17.5 uh, gigawatts mm -hmm. uh, and the annual production will come over 50 terawatt hours. Uh, Sweden have for long uh, have a total uh, consumption in Sweden of electricity of 150. So uh, compared to that figure, uh, wind will now come up to, to be uh, the, the second largest uh, electricity producer uh, after, uh, after hydro. Uh, um, until now, hydro and nuclear have been dominating, uh, but uh, at, at today, uh, the, the, the distribution between uh, wind, hydro and, and nuclear is uh, approximately uh, one third each, uh, and, but wind is uh, growing rapidly, and uh, even if there are political uh, uh, efforts to uh, build uh, a new nuclear. It's a very, very long and slow pro uh, process, uh, while the, 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 the need for, for new uh, electricity is, is uh, here and now. So uh, it seems like the government, uh, e even if the, 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 the political color of the government today in Sweden is more for nuclear than for wind, have been forced to accept that wind is fast and cheap. <laughs> 10 minutes are over. Okay, um, uh, here you can see that an overview of where we are today, uh, where the, the, the yellow line is the accumulated uh, numbers of megawatt. Uh, and we are right now uh, around 15,000 uh, megawatt. Uh, and the number of turbines is uh, a little bit over 5,000. And uh, for the coming two, three years, uh, uh, we will raise to uh, not up to 6,000, but uh, something below that. Uh, and uh, because of the, the, the turbine's size to, uh, today, uh, the, the, the energy output uh, will raise dramatically and come up over, to, over the 50 terawatt hours. Uh, in Sweden, it has now for long uh, been, been uh, uh, the, the permitting process that have been slow. Uh, so uh, once uh, once permit comes through, it, it can have quite often been like the 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 the, the, the size of the turbines that uh, are allowed to be built is a little bit. Uh, out of date, so so uh, that that's a problem, uh, and that means that not all consented projects will be built because uh, th there is no economics in the later. So we have uh, when we are doing our forecasts, uh, uh, we uh, divide uh, the number of turbines, uh, possible turbines, in six categories. Uh, on top, you can see under construction, they will definitely, they are, uh, their construction is, well, as I said, under construction, so they will definitely happen. Announced, they will also uh, uh, be hap happen, happen, but the formal investment decision haven't been made yet. Then we have the turbines that have permits, but as I said, not everyone, uh, 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 all of them will be, uh, uh, in operation. So uh, here uh, we have a, a de decrease of, of, the, of what is going to be realized. And then uh, further down, the project under permit review, uh, they have not received uh, their permits yet. And they are, of course, a uh, longer way. And uh, then the two latch one, last one is the consultations. The, the projects are in a pre-study phase or even uh, earlier, this is an early stage projects. And uh, if we uh, see, uh, if, if, if we sum up uh, these three, six categories, if you have the three highest one on the construction announced and with permits, you can see in the total uh, column uh, far right, 
that uh, the, the capacity on the construction is just over 4,000 uh, megawatt, uh, while the announced ones is uh, uh, 1,000. And uh, it's also uh, important to notice here that uh, no one of the offshore projects are uh, during in, in these phases, but we have, when we come down to the category with permits, there we have the first offshore project coming up. Uh, which will give uh, uh, a higher number of, of uh, uh, megawatts. Uh, and the three uh, lower categories, uh, which uh, is a high number, but uh, they will not happen, all of them, uh, gives us uh, a very high figures. So if I go on here a little bit fast, you can see that uh, in the permitting phase, we have 366 terawatt hours. It's a, it's a massive uh, amount of, of energy. And uh, it's the, the two, uh, two categories, project under permit and these who are under consultation. Uh, all this will definitely not happen. But uh, uh, if we, for short looks, what the need is, and here it's not uh, the wind association that comes up with the figures it, it's the tso and it's the swedish energy agency and uh, the, the the swedish energy market inspectorate uh, and so on and the transportation because uh, uh, cars and, and also lorries uh, are going over more and more to, to electricity and uh, uh, also, the, the industrial uh, expansion in, in the northern takes a lot. Uh, so they have a, a high and a low scenario. The, the, the high scenario uh, is uh, <coughs> reaching uh, 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 very high figures, uh, uh, which is uh, increased to 280 already in 2035 and, and uh, up over 370 uh, 20 years from now. And the lower scenario is 210 uh, by 2045. Uh, uh, and the, the only way to reach figures up to this level uh, is a massive uh, expansion of, of wind. Uh, and uh, if we shall uh, come to the 280 at the 2035, uh, we need 110 terawatt hours more than we have today. Uh, and this is a yearly uh, expansion to nine terawatts a year. Uh, and uh, uh, as I said also that, that uh, today, uh, uh, the, the, the projects under permit review or in consultation uh, is a very high number. So uh, <clears throat> we have summarized uh, how, how this can happen. And uh, if we, we, the, what we know for sure is that we have 52 uh, terawatt hours after uh, in, in 2025. And uh, then uh, we need uh, uh, another uh, two thirds of the 18 that is permitted. Uh, two thirds, that's uh, the statistic what comes out of permitted, but not built uh, uh, or not the uh, finance project, but two thirds of 18, <clears throat> that's 12. So if you add 12 to the 52, we are up in 64, 65 terawatt by 2027. And uh, what is also statistical uh, uh, seen is that 50% of or project that is in the permitting process uh, receives permits, uh, both permits, investment decisions, uh, which gives us 50% um, uh, will give, give us another 12 terawatt hours, which push us up to 77. And then we come to the offshore, the first offshore project, which is clear flux in between Sweden and, and Germany. Uh, that if that also happened, we have another uh, 2.8, which comes gives us up to 80. And finally, 50% uh, of the offshore that is in the permitting process can add another 43. And that gives us 123, which is, uh, well, the, the, the lower of the, the, the assumed needs we have. Can you please now come to the conclusion? 
uh, yes, we, we have uncertainties here, uh, and um, uh, they, they are uh, a number, and um, we have uh, the, the, I can take the next slide actually, the, 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 it, the, the investments in Sweden are primarily made by foreign uh, investors uh, in its pensions funds and so on, and we have to keep uh, the attractiveness uh, to, to, to these investors. But there, there is a number. We have saw an uh, awful picture uh, we, every day from Ukraine, what is happening and how that has uh, increased electricity, the aggression here. And, and also uh, the inflation is very high, it put up the prices. Uh, United States they have announced that that their re re reduction act which will perhaps uh, bring more interest to the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, and and uh, there are also uh, a couple of others uh, demands that have to 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 uh, be addressed. But the main thing in Sweden is the permitting uh, and uh, <coughs> the. It's needed that that the, the 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 government will do something. It takes primary five, six, seven, eight years to have a project to come through, and uh, that slow uh, and, and that also according to the grid issues. And the grid issue is is uh, definitely an, an uh, bottleneck here to come further. So uh, yes, that's what what my pictures actually. Sorry for it went a little bit over time. Now I can't hear Stefan. You're muted. Okay, now I'm back. So thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that as well. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive uh, presentation of the Swedish wind power market, which I think is also showing us the challenges, but uh, showing us a very concrete pathway, how Sweden can achieve the, yeah, uh, climate neutrality as we call, or the 100% renewable energy. Um, you have pointed uh, towards the uh, permitting processes um, as one major barrier. And I would just like to recall the study that we made a little bit more than a year ago, and which we also concluded that that is a global problem in most parts of the world because the average planning and permitting time altogether globally is more than five years. And obviously we have uh, the, the, the duration um, in European countries. And I just look at the table that we published at that time. Sweden is indeed one of the countries where it takes longer than the average, like many European countries. And that's certainly something that has to be dealt with. Um, one answer that we, that we are uh, always recommending is of course, uh, a, a strong community engagement process so that the people who are living close by wind farms are part of it and there's less resistance and then hopefully less people who bring such a project to court. Um, but yeah, so we see that this is, uh, as you describe it, one of the main barriers um, to achieve what the world needs to achieve. This is the, um, yeah, okay. as, as I said, the most common term now, climate neutrality. Do we have any questions? Do we have any final comments before we conclude the first part of this webinar? I see what? there is uh, Jami Hossein raising his hand. So if I invite you to please unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, I put in a comment on the chat also. And uh, what I see is that uh, we have very interesting presentations from five, six countries uh, in this part of the webinar. And uh, then you will have uh, more uh, in the later part of the webinar. So uh, from across the world, we have a lot of these countries which are projecting their installations and uh, uh, various other facts. But most importantly, we are often struggling to figure out you know, uh, what kind of installations uh, will take place uh, over the next uh, uh, eight, 10 years. So it might be a good idea because many people have uh, projected that by 2030, what kind of capacity they, they will have that uh, if uh, all the participants in this webinar finally come back with some uh, 
uh, numbers uh, uh, that in their countries, uh, for example, Sweden or Pakistan or India or China, uh, what kind of capacities will be set up in next eight, 10 years? This will be more realistic because this is from the ground. Yes, so that's certainly also something where we're also trying now. We made our annual uh, statistics uh, survey. We also yeah. always ask for the predictions. They can be wrong, as we uh, you realized that we made a mid-2022 survey and the I, I, we compared then what came out at the end of the year to what was predicted. Um, and most of the countries state belong their own predictions. Um, and that happened within just a couple of months. But of course, uh, I do agree that it's worthwhile and we are gathering that and we will still work on that and uh, try to also present an outlook. And uh, our, our outlook that we present is based on that as well. Yeah. So do we have other questions or comments? If that is not the case, then I would like to say a big thank you to all our speakers of this session where we started with Australia and why uh, listening to several Asian countries now have reached Europe. Um, we will have now a one and a half hour break and then we continue with uh, again Europe and uh, some African markets and um, then followed by the American continent. So I would uh, again say thank you and uh, invite you, of course, to join us again. As I said, we will continue in one and a half hours. Um, the recording of this webinar is already now. There is a live stream on Facebook where you can watch that. Uh, the recordings will be made available, as I've already in indicated, in our YouTube channel. So all those presentations you can again um, watch. Um, after this, this will take a little bit time. So with this, um, enjoy the break and I hope to see you again in 90 minutes. Okay, bye. Thank you, Stefan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh,